not going to be able to offer a dialectical summation of what <coughs> will have happened here and between us. It'll take its time. We don't know how long that is, how many years, how many centuries, and as we've said elsewhere, where anything lands in a trauma zone, in a dream or dreams. Also, we, I wanted to, um, to mention that some of us have worked on interference, the parasite, the parasite in French, the phantom noises, the ambient intrusions or emissions, and we have um, a new soundtrack um, of Emmanuel here, and we want to just be aware of that, be aware of um, where we speak from, what kinds of other sonic layers are, are somehow offering themselves or <coughs> muffling or muffled. I say this much too quickly, but a number of us, please give, extend me credit on this, have been thinking about static, about the marginal notation, the other sound track, to which Heidegger has pointed us when he began to uh, raise the decibels of the philosophical utterance. He, some of us have discuss the rant, philosophy in pianissimo, very quiet, muted form of, of thinking and speaking. So we want to be aware of the place from which, also in terms of, of um, sonic overlay, we're trying to talk to each other. And the ladies from Laurie was talking to me about the kick um, the gesture of the kick to add to the vocabulary of the the prod, right? Am I misrepresenting no, you? No, the poet has, has kicked out of the Republic, I think, in Book 10. And, and where does poetry wind up in, in a Heideggerian way in the text? The poet reemerges in the text. Um, and on 18, Heidegger talks about technia belonging to the bringing forth to poesis. It is something poetic. So the question concerning poetry as exile, the exiled poet coming back and kind of haunting the text again as a meaning. So the kick also as an almost um, addictive um, description. I get a kick out of you, but um, uh, that kind of stoos that a kick in English is, or kicking to the um, curb, kicking out or even um, kicking with, kick back, um, kicking to as in soccer. So we, we want to maybe, um, before we click, also continue to move with the kick that you, you, um, you handed over to my custody. So right now, before um, we, as we kick in, um, I thought that um, Chris suggested that we um, we consider what was said about the tax. Right before that, he said something about courage in Heidegger, that Heidegger calls upon us to have the courage to do something, to expose, to vulnerabilize, can't even pronounce it, um, to open up in a certain way. And this also is a reading of Hölderlin, a great poem, or him, well, no, it's a poem called Dich de Mut, which is the poet's courage. So, what is it in what we're doing, even as we seem to be um, a little muffled, quiet, quiescent, the docile body is bent over, taking notes, opening ears, and so on. The, um, the question could be, outside of all of those heavily and, and um, narcotically imposed narratives of the action hero, of what constitutes courage, what in, in the sense of shyness, reticence, the quietness of a relentless trek in these mountains of um, 
that have called to us and that have enveloped us. What does moot or um, courage even mean? And this is something that I'd like us to, exactly, my point. Um, so, um, and why was it so crucial for Heidegger to, um, to consider Hildenin's, if it's a call, to courage, a courage that wouldn't be the kind of uh, vulgarized, militarized zones of behavior or call to arms, but that's always part of the call, possible call that you might miss here. If we have time, maybe we will go into uh, Derridian space momentarily when he reads Heidegger's Schicken and Schicksal. We, we heard the word destiny. Destiny um, calls up the thought of destination, if final destination. And the question of the destination of the call ought to concern us and how you know you're being called or whether the call constitutively might misfire, find the wrong target, um, hit or reach an innocent bystander, be misconstrued, or some weird catch in the outfield of meaning. Uh, it's not clear what the destiny or destination of the call can be if it's not also built in to an understanding of disruption, dropping the call, disconnecting, and so on, which Heidegger does not consider, it seems to me, unless that's too dogmatic of me. But let me just put it out there, if necessary, with a hypothetical inflection. When Heidegger speaks of destiny and the call, even though, as Binsk himself has shown, the call comes from me, and from beyond me, so it's already a split origin in a sense. Where does it come from? How can you trace the call? Nonetheless, I would want to um, sick away or shake up and unsettle any certitude about where it's coming from and um, where it might be um, hoping to reach. Because we laughed a little when I said every psycho is on a mission, or hears a call, or I was called by God to do this. But isn't every call possibly receptive to that possibility, that it's some psychotic calling you to sacrifice your son, Isaac? Yeah. <laughs> Well, we were talking about, uh, you know, that I'm going to pick up with uh, courage. And it's also heart, moot, you know, it's, it's heart. And, uh, so I think that's a whole big topic, heart in philosophy. Um, or the mutt. No. Or the mutt. <laughs> <laughs> that's two T's. Zero. Um, Mutter, anyway. Um, oh, yeah, Mutter. <laughs> But I, was, I wanted to take up with this issue of the task and the mission, and uh, <coughs> just a little bit. One, one of the big themes in the question concerning <coughs> technology, which uh, I have to say, I, it's always, uh, always intrigued me, but it seems a little stunted in its, uh, uh, in its development. Um, it's the issue of freedom. There's, there's, a, uh, there's a considerable considerable reflection on the nature of freedom. And I, I, this is, I really would have had to study the German to talk about this in, in, in an appropriate way, and it's just not in my head well enough, I'm just as German's not well enough in my head. But um, he's, his question, um, in, in trying to turn to art, he, he's suggesting to us, it's not about turning away from technology. It's not about um, having some sort of escape route or, or some uh, you know, alternative um, site. Rather, uh, he says, what we have to find, in, first of all, we have to find our relation to technology. And, and, and as, he, as he tells us, this is, this is you know, to use this word destiny, you know, this, this, this is 
uh, where we are in our time. This is the way um, being gives itself to be thought, and being gives itself to be lived, I suppose you could say, in our existence. We, we are, as he, says, uh, as he says, and as you've been considering, we are called to this relation to um, things and to ourselves, which he calls technology. So th this is not um, a bad term in, um, in contemporary history, that this is part of a long history, um, an unfolding history, or rather um, a, a sent history in different uh, mittenses, different, different destinies, different, um, different, which, which take the form of epochs, if you close it. But so the, the, the technology is not some horrible mistake um, uh, made by um, particularly perhaps a, a group of Western nations and peoples, um, but rather it is, um, it is something um, that they are um, sort of sent into, so to speak, and, and it becomes um, a directive of, of sorts. Um, and the question is, how can we find a relation to this um, this, this destiny, this sending of a, of a way of being in relation. Can we find, can we, first of all, can we find this relation? Can we understand this relation as a relation to, um, to being or truth? And, and can we understand it as part of an event? So the, the first issue is to, is to find our relation to technology. That's in the very first paragraph, if, if, you, if you look at it. Our, our, ta our task is to find a free relationship to technology. Um, and and they, so the question of freedom then is how, do, how does one assume the call in such a way that it's a, it's a free relation and perhaps allows another, um, another stance, another hearing, another, another form of elaboration which would come about in a poetic relation. But in, in the, at page 313 in the uh, big full paragraph right at the center of the page, um, he's talking about the relation between um, the correct and the true. And as in the Arjun Lorca of Art, which we've been working through in my class this week, the, the issue is trying to think the, uh, the act of creation from the event of truth, this, this appropriating event as it is described here. And it, uh, you'll remember the passage, those of you who've been working with me, where he says that uh, it, we don't presuppose truth. Truth presupposes us. And, and we are, in, in, in that sense, placed into a relation to, to things, and we, we perceive from that. Um, so that's what he's talking about here, and that's in a sense what he wants us to understand in a larger sense, this technology is itself a form of revealing, a form of, of uh, alethe. And in this middle of the page he says, only, uh, only the true brings us into a free relationship which, with that which concerns us from its essence. Only the true brings us into a free relationship with that which concerns us from its essence. And here, concerning it means we are dressed, we are taken, we are, we are um, commandeered in various ways of thinking about this relation to technology. But in the essence of technology, we, we, are, we are addressed. And he says, it's only from the true that we can find a, a free relationship to, it, to, to that address. Accordingly, he says, the correct instrumental definition of technology still does not show us technology's essence. In order that we may arrive at this, arrive at this, or at least come close to it, we must seek the true by way of the correct. We must ask, what is the instrument of itself? Within what do things as means and end belong? So, what does it do? Instead of, you know, turning back immediately from the question of technology to the question of truth, um, and, and just as in the origin of the work of art, instead of going straight to, to truth, he goes into equipment. He says, okay. Uh, equipment has furnished us the way of thinking about form and matter. Um, it has completely expanded its, its uh, sway as a concept over all relations to beings. How are we going to get past this? Well, let's think about it a little more closely. You know, and it goes back into it. It does the exact same thing here. It goes to what is ready to hand, what is most immediately in our experience, and says, let's, let's think about it. Um, so, is, how, how, how then do we, do, do, how, how can we go into technology to understand what is given to us um, as a, as a Destiny of technology, and I just wanted to comment on this idea of, of, a, of a task in that sense, or, um, or or the nature of the movement. The um, the passage that I cited um, of, from Blanchot this week when I was talking about suffering, he says um, he describes the way in which the self is lost in suffering, 
which is always a suffering that comes from another. So there's always a, 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 a you know, relation to autonomy or a relation to the other human being in, 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 in something like suffering. It's, but this um, carries us, um, well, it carries us into another relation. And as, as Blanchot describes this movement, he says, um, perhaps, perhaps, thought is what happens as we, as we move into suffering and in a certain sense allow ourselves to move into it through a, what he calls elsewhere a kind of transgressive patience or passivity. If we, if we, if we suffer suffering um, in, in, a, in a particular way, then, then we can move into what of suffering is not um, entirely um, I think programmed by suffering. There he talks about a language, you know, the word um, uh, uh, matter coming upon us. And, he's, and, and, and what he's talking about is a movement into, you know, into the essence of suffering, if you will, if we use this language here, um, whereby there's an encounter with what he calls um, the neutral of suffering. And that relation releases a, a, a kind of free relation to suffering. You don't escape suffering, um, you, you, but there is a thought of suffering by which there is a kind of, he says, there's a distance. Um, you are even, you're suffering even more for having to think suffering. So it's not a, it's not a transcendence, it's not an escape, it's not a, a deviation or an evasion, but rather it's a movement into this uh, passion that allows, a, I don't want to say this too easily, but a free relation to this passion. Um, and that's why it's free is problematic. It's not deliverance. It's Everything very is problematic. Everything truth. Yeah, all human. of these words. <laughs> yeah, all of these words. You. But, no, sorry. No, but but, to, but to, make, to, to make my point here, there is a, this is what I think um, what Lacan talked about and what Lyotard talked about and Deleuze also talked about. It. This is this movement of going into it as opposed to trying to, to escape it or, you know, courageously taking some other path. This is what they called umu. This is this is a uh, almost a allowing oneself to, to be taken by. What do they call humor? Humor, uh, but uh, but it's not it's it's, you know, it's not a comic relation. It's rather this giving up to in a, in a in a certain kind of passivity. Lacan talks about this in the beginning of the four fundamental cons when he when he says uh, uh, you know he's being sold out by students, right? He's he's, he's um, I mean he's literally his students are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's no money in this one, but anyway, uh, and this is it. He, and, and, he, and, and Lacan is, you know, he's, 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 he's playing, you know, with the fact that he's, he has really been shafted by a whole group of people that he thought. <laughs> and he says, um, but you know, isn't, isn't this our position in, in advanced capitalism anyway? Aren't we constantly sold out? And, and he says, perhaps there is a way of living this position in relation to the object and so on. I don't which, buy it. No, well, I'm anyway, kidding. <laughs> so he, and he, and he, and he names yeah. this he names this movement of humor. So instead of, uh, you know, a, a denunciating and, and so forth, he takes this, he says, yeah, I'm going to suffer this relation and I'm going to explore in this suffering, this, this other relation to the, or to in the object. Or in yeah. yeah. So it's, um, it's not, a, in other words, it's not a seeking of, of a way out. It's a seeking of a way in. Uh, to technology, and and it's there that he starts to go toward the this essence of technology, where he begins to think of it as, as uh, first of all, as destiny, and then as a granting. And the question is, you know, uh, along with this word of geschick, there's also uh, well, there is, I think, the word geschick, and you know, again, my German is failing me right now, but geschick is also a, a Holinian word for dexterity. You know, you 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 know how to use things well. well it's yeah. um, it, it is a so geschickt or geschick. That's very interesting. Yeah. So yeah. it's, a, it's again, like it's a usage. It's, 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 it's a way of um, having a, a kind of a, a free relation to the shiksa. To, to sure. The <laughs> well, I'd like to, uh, but Magnolia had something to say. Score yeah. two for us, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, free, <laughs> this idea of the free relation, which is anything but free, is sort of the free meandering of Heidegger, which is also anything but free. I just I wonder if you could just talk a little bit. We had talked about this yesterday a bit about sort of what is foreclosed by Heidegger. Heidegger we're talking so much about what is opened up, but where is the where is the, what are the limits that are being imposed? And this free relation I see as a limit. Can I, can I um, piggyback on that for my um, jump in, or do you have something to say? Cool. Okay, so. Um, this is, this is something I, I would want to, uh, to continue to um, elaborate as a question. You're, you're absolutely right to, to um, remind us that Heidegger called it. He, um, he really 
really saw, and Heidegger himself, if we can still say that, thought that his thought on technology was it, and that people didn't realize that that was his great contribution, um, that this was where something was uh, moving and shaking. At the same time, you know, I, I try to say, and I don't want to collapse things that you so beautifully set out. It's because of the metronome that I'm squeezed here. Um, National Socialism was the technologically constellated state. Heidegger, even though he, he does say everything that you say he says, I, I still, and this is again shorthand and too quick, least stated, but for the purpose of a pedagogical kick, perhaps. Um, yes, there is the complicated itinerary of, of not, that. in other words, technology can't be turned off or we can't turn our backs to it. There's no off, off ramp, there's no, um, technologically free zone, like a drug free zone, if there's that. Um, so, but nonetheless, it seems to me that he reaches for something prior to technology, and again, a terrible abbreviation here, and better than technology's revealing. Th that, that would be one of my questions, and so to put it in the um, very, thoughtfully uh, cast language that Magnolia just brought forth, is there something foreclosive in the very act of putting forth um, this hope or suspicion that somewhere there might be located a free relation to technology? Um, again, let me just say that what Heidegger called as a problem for us is, is absolutely unbypassable and, and crucial and compelling. He called it, he saw it, he said it, and he said that we are under the sway of the dominion of technology. And there's all sorts of registers and ways to consider that, even your own most desire, should you think you have such a thing, is already technologically, um, um, let's say, um, tethered and manipulated. You're turned on, you're turned off, um, et cetera, et cetera. The, much of even the desire of, uh, the rhetoric of desire is already a technological, um, is de technologically determined so that something that would consider itself to be free of the dominion of technology is in your bodies, under your skin, um, it blew me away, um, so on and so forth. These are all, so we've become uh, uh, really plugged into the technological in ways that are so, um, I mean, even for Freud, this, uh, the, the, he has to and he uses um, electricity and the metaphors of, of all sorts of um, electronic, pre-electronic and technological devices to, to set up um, psychic intimacy even. So there's no off switch to the technological, nor can you point to anything that is spared technological, the technological incursion in some way. And despite Heidegger's exemplary carefulness in saying we're not we're just we can't say fuck it we can't we're, we're not going to handle or deal I'm sorry I shouldn't have used that word uh, we're, we're not going to deal with technology it's encroached so deeply and so um, irreversibly that um, how do we cope and I think that's one of the questions of Heidegger's gesture, unless I'm mistaken, and it is uh, pulled by a kind of, again, too fast negativity of, of stance. Negativity, I mean, he, he falls into two negative stance. He slips in that sense, or, or he, he doesn't obey his own I'm, diagnosis of the extremity of technique. Is no, what I mean is um, that 
it doesn't come, the questioning doesn't come from, again, a million quotation marks, a free zone. Oh, yeah. um, that there's, there's this despair, then there's the um, question that I, we haven't um, touched of the industrialization of corpses and so on. That's another field of, of concern. But um, th that would be one question. The other thing then as a pedagogical thing is um, Chris just reminded us that, that uh, technology is sent to us. There's emittance, transmittance, emission. Uh, I, I just wanted to footnote and point out how important this shift to sending is that Heidegger performs and insists upon, as in uh, a song such as by Aretha Franklin, um, You Send Me. Um, the, the sending that occurs since Heidegger, we are sent, and Nietzsche starts this machinery, if that's what it is, uh, when he says, why do people ask me if, if I wrote Zarathustra? Zarathustra befell me, it happened to me. Nietzsche relinquishes what has now become so popular, such as agency, um, the autonomous self at the wheel of, I mean, this has everything to do also and perhaps is in tension with, or needs the refinement of, of, of thought. Production doesn't mean that there's a sovereign subject or some sort of powerful self that is responsible for or at the origin of productive behavior or, or accomplishment. When Heidegger shifts to the place or the emplacement of sending and brings sending together with destiny, everything, the whole terrain reformats and there's a new cartography in town or in the neighborhood of thought, which means where there's a different kind of uh, velocity, different relatedness. You are sent or something is sent to you. So sending truly um, changes the way you can no longer talk about a subject or object. It really busts up a whole bunch of strongholds of our thinking of, of um, I'm going to leave that blank, all thinking actually and all appropriations because something happens when things start getting sent off and you are sent. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let me try to go from that question. Um, where, where is Heidegger when he's trying to um, think this question, the, the free relation to technology? You know, in 19... 52, um, two years before this, was the date when he republished, he allowed the republication of the introduction of metaphysics, where he, he allows to stand the, the statement, um, it, uh, the phrase concerning the inner truth and greatness of National Socialism. And his, um, his explanation of that in, in, in this period, in the 50s, um, he says, uh, yes, I'm not going to back off this, um, uh, this diagnosis, because I had understood, he, he suggests, that National Socialism was carrying forward what uh, was the most advanced form of technological thinking uh, um, of, of our time. That this, this was, um, I, I, you know, in a certain sense, there's a, there's a kind of implicit admission. Yes, there is something, there's something, there's a, there's a kind of error here, there's, a, there's something almost monstrous about this, but it's because it has pushed forward um, technology more than any other, um, any, any other uh, movement, <laughs> And so in that, um, he's saying, this is what I meant by the inner truth and greatness of, of, national, of national socialism. Well, yeah, and, and, and he even says, this is what I meant when I, when I wrote that. Well, you know, frankly, if you read the introduction to metaphysics, that just doesn't hold up. It's, it's, um, it, it's really a, 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 an extraordinary sort of effort to, to kind of um, twist what is perfectly legible in the text in, in other respects. And so you don't want to fall too easily into this... Um, into this diagnosis, and with regard to that, I mean, I think this question of the, the you know the industrialized production of corpses is really is really very important because what's you know that that sentence um, is taken as one of the most scandalous sentences he ever wrote uh, regarding um, uh, the, the, the death camps and, and, and the Shoah and so forth. 
because he didn't talk about it except with such phrases. But um, you know, that's, I, I mean, I, he's saying the exact same thing about agriculture here. Um, he says, in that sentence, I can't remember the exact words, but he says, um, this is, uh, the, the production of corpses in a death camp is exactly like mechanized agriculture. It's, it's the same kind of, of technical appro uh, um, appropriation of, of what is. The problem, and, and for me, is, is, is what he said later that day. Um, because I think, in a certain sense, he's right about a, a mechanized agriculture. Um, the problem is that he, sa he said, well, the Jews, you know, the Jews who were, who were, were massacred in the death camps, um, they didn't have a chance to die. They were denied their dying. And, and again, I forget the exact words he's using, but they, they, they were just uh, um, you know, slaughtered. They weren't killed, or they, 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 didn't, they didn't experience their death. Well, Again, that is an, an astonishing sort of statement because um, you know, Ceylon you know, talks a lot about going to death in the death camps and the presence of death. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of testimony that goes differently. And Heidegger is, is, is you know, so full of himself at this moment talking about the uh, technology that he's in a, almost killing them twice. You know, there, there, there's a complete you know, foreclosure of the corpses in a way, or, or, or of the dying that, that has occurred in the forms of dying. So, there's a case of, of what is not allowed there. Um, but in terms of technology, well, I think he's right in, in, in terms of the mechanized agriculture. Um, and, and those of us who are interested in the food industry, you know, and, and cuisine and so forth, uh, I think are becoming more and more aware of just to what extent this description of turning nature into a standing reserve is, is powerfully um, diagnostic with regard to, to mechanized agriculture. I mean, I think in some respects he doesn't go far enough in talking about the way um, humankind is itself as part of the bishtand, you know, as part of the standing reserve. Um, I, I think he is, uh, and there are, there are astonishing statements, but he, you know, he, he tries to say, well, it's not, it's not that far along. Don't worry, we humans are not quite taken that far. Well, I think that we have, I mean, in, in a sense. And, and um, you know, a movie like The Matrix is actually quite effective in, in evoking that. Um, the, the illusion of our lives, you know, behind it, you've got um, human humankind like a herd at being being um, uh, being maintained um, for the purposes of a larger um, system. So, um, you know, in, in a sense, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm, I think this is, I, I think your question is very pertinent. It's in Heidegger's relation to, I mean, it's, but it's precisely, you know, it's precisely for the fact that this is where we are, you know, that it's so difficult, and and uh, and he's trying to invite us to. Heidegger always does this. He said, we, we, we can't pretend to stand outside where we are. We have to, we have to think that relational uh, sending, or as you would say. We have to think from where we are. And, and, and thinking is the task of assuming that, that finitude. That's, that's another version of the finitude. But in terms of, you know, I, 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 I think that the question you're raising about this kind of suspect turn to, to an origin that would be um, in technology that would be perhaps a way out. You know? I mean, it happens in this page uh, 335, where, with this really astonishing statement where he says, revealing is that destiny, so truth, revealing, which ever suddenly and inexplicably to all thinking apportions itself, and this is, I thought of you immediately, there's the partition, there's the score, um, apportions itself into the revealing that brings forth and the revealing that challenges, and which allots itself to man. So suddenly there's a truth, um, there's a partage. Right? There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a division in truth. There's a, there, there, there's, there is a, um, a sharing out. And it goes two ways. <coughs> He's saying it apportions itself into the revealing that brings forth. That's the Herforstein, which he attributes to poiesis and art. Um, and the revealing that challenges. That's the Herforstein that, that is proper to, the, um, to that, that, that sort of technical way of being, and which allots itself to men. The revealing that challenges has its origin as a destiny in bringing forth. And now that suddenly, this div division has a priority. Um, poiesis is the more original form. And, and at least in, in, up to this point in the text, you, you, I'm inclined, to, having read it quickly again, to, to think he has told us that poiesis is itself a form of technology, that these two are in, in intimate, uh, are intimate in, in their essence. But suddenly he is, he's dividing them out from one another. Um, and Poesis is given the more originary um, status. And I think that's where your, your question takes its, its, uh, you know, its real bite in this effort to create this division of the origin and then a leverage in relation to technology. But, um, I think a lot of this essay is suggesting that Poesis is itself a form of technology. And, and one must try to think that 
for uh, that, 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 that technological dimension in, in poetry. But at the same time, it's really quite fascinating because he says, in this sending, uh, if we think that sending uh, more originally or more essentially, we'll understand that the sending is a granting. And he says, oddly enough, he says, technology allows us to see this. Um, and, and if we go through this text, I, I started underlining all the references to seeing, watching, um, uh, discovering ourselves and so forth. There's a, there's a metaphorics of, of vision you know, that, is, that is quite insistent. And I'm sure you could do a lot with it. Um, but it's, it, 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 he, he suggests if, if, we, if, we, you know, if we look more carefully um, in the essence of technology, then we discover that sending is, in fact, a granting. And oddly enough, guess who we, we did Goethe there, citing a poet to, to give the, you know, to give this, what, what technology is giving us, you know, which is really strange at that point. You know, that, that, that he says, um, if we look more closely at technology, we, we'll understand that sending is granted, giving, and, and so on. And he says, and our, te and our evidence for this comes from Goethe, who, who once wrote a, a, the word wären for, for lasting as gewären and, and gives granted. And, and there's the evidence for the fact that in sending there is there's this more essential granting. And, and, but if that more essential granting is attributed to poiesis, how come we see it in technology? I mean, th th there's some incredible instability at that point. And in this effort to establish that division or that, 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 that score, you know, where, whereby there's, there's a, um, a partage, uh, which fate divides in a certain sense, and, or, or destiny divides. And, and we, as human beings, have in the, our freedom is our relation to that division. Is is, is uh, you know the fact that, that there's a split or there's a, there's, a, there's a there's a difference that opens in in, in the origin of technology. Ben? Yeah, I, I don't know if this is. Um, I guess a little bit ago, I think right before the break, um, you spoke of language or how do you spoke thinking of language using him, and I'm thinking about language as a technology, um, as a sort of primary technology at least and rhetoric and grammar and things kinds of technologies that um, kind of presuppose and not dealt with and, and you were saying how language is this thing that doesn't that you know, needs to be dealt with. Um, I don't know, it's, it seems like that's like the technological point on which it it all rests and, and I'm wondering how that like I don't know. I mean I don't know if I have a real well formulated question, but I, I guess I keep, I keep going back to this thought of how language as itself, a technology or technologically implicated thing, gets bound up in the, you know, and, and people talk about how different languages you can, you can understand things differently, or, or you know, like modes of, like you, you only have access to things that you can access in language, things like that, and the, the same way of technology is granting or giving access to certain things. Like, things. So, so that like, or technology of language. Yeah, I think it's a things. profound question. I, I just this I, I sometimes obnoxiously intercede as a coach. So Ben just asked a third point for us. Come on, uh, a, a, a stunning question that I I appreciated the uh, the hesitation, the self sabotage, the rhetoric of faltering that you included. But if you you know come from this proud lineage, um, you will then edit out or consider doing so that I don't know, I'm not sure, I didn't really think about this, um, you know, the self-canceling moments. And even though I don't urge you to, to you know, speak truth, perhaps um, you could practice in the safe space of the next few minutes, you know, a certain kind of elegant expression that, that your thought really deserves as backup or as, as shelter. Um, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, that was a, you know, this question of the technology, technological language is something that Jack Derrida would be um, a, a, good, a good voice to go to. But again, I, this is partly why I'm, and I, I, this work is still to be done. I, I have to work more I have, to, I, have to, I have to work more with this notion of usage because um, and, 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 it, it immediately connotes the way like we work with language. I mean, um, Wittgenstein used the word Gebrauch uh, 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 for, for meaning itself. Meaning is usage. Is it? And uh, usage is also Brauchtum. It's all the customs, all the tradition, all the, you know, all these, these, these uh, habits and um, sedimented 
ways of, uh, of, of, I suppose, doing technologically as well. So I, I think this is a very good question that you're raising. And, and, and that's maybe why I was, you know, sort of uh, obscurely sensing, why aren't we talking more about language in this essay? Mm. Um, even though, of course, it's there in, in, in many ways, and in, in Spur of Pichetel in, in particular, is, is, uh, uh, you know, he's really foregrounds this, this play of language that's going on. And yet, you would expect, you know, it's in this time, 1954, to be, to be talking about the, the instrumental character of language, and, you know, the relation between means and end, um, as we might rethink it from this notion of use. So um, let's not forget that Heidegger would claim very likely that he's working with the essence of technology, which uh, in the first 50 registers means he's not engaging um, what we hear by technology. So that even the translation of the Frage nach der Technik is very um, unstable if you're going to um, insist that it says technology that those of us who have worked on this have to stop there and wonder is it already a, um, an abuse a catachristic even um, insistence because technik is not the same as technology um, and technics may not this is what Sam Weber opts for technics that's problematic as well for other reasons so um, Heidegger at one point, let me remind you of this, says um, that it's not because there are machines that we are in the age of technology, um, but there are machines because we are in the age of technology. So um, machines are almost subsidiary, secondary, um, plugins to to something that has happened that should not be confused with the technicity of technology. Now that distinction and determination might be something you want to question, but first it has to be acknowledged, right? Did you want to have a question? Oh no. What was it? <laughs> Language. I think I was just trying to get us a point. Language you know. instrumentality? Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, it was on Ben's point about oh, just where, where language appears in the text. And again, I don't know if it's a question. And how the whole fundamental argument really stems from this idea of, of the, the word techni, like the, or the word technology, and how that maybe is where it appears as a methodological approach to yeah. you know, the originary words of Greek thought. So that was just... Um, yeah, I, I want to pose a question that is perhaps too late, um, but I associated um, what we were talking about in the, in the beginning, right, with the poet and um, authority, and authority that doubles and triples and so on and so on. <coughs> so, yeah, you remember that? And so I wondered now whether here, um, first of all, I, we were talking in the other class uh, with the um, <clears throat> with Abitaz about um, rumor, and so one question that I that, that popped up in my head was um, if if we multiply the authorities, can we then do we then encounter language as as a rumor, right? And then <clears throat> the following question would be um, about what language are we are we talking here, right? How many languages are there? <coughs> Is language itself an authority? And so on and so on, you, you see the line. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, perhaps you could elaborate on that a bit about this. Well, I, I, I should let, do you want to start on rumor? Um, since, uh, since that's where you started. I mean, I could talk just a little bit about um, different languages. What I'm, what I'm going at is, is among others, um, the, the question, how, how is Heidegger here is himself used by language? How does he use language? What is he doing here? Right. So if we, if 
we like um, start to think about who, who has the authority about who we need to make sharp of that. Authority too. Yeah. Just tell me if you don't want to. I'll just I'll just go on a bit. But. I I can um, bring up the rear if you start. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm going to oversimplification. I apologize very again the same thing, but <laughs> <laughs> can so, um, so if Did we lose a point? No, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> this, uh, oh <laughs> in my oversimplification, you one could say that uh, this um um hashtag is a kind of final point between authenticity and authenticity and between uh, language and technology. So that uh, you have a one without the other and sense, so you have this openness and infinitude. So I was wondering, this uh, conception is, uh, must not be uh, relative to language. So it's a half grabe, what you were saying before, but I don't think it's Benjamin, because in Benjamin, when it talks about uh, half grabe translator, it talks about translations, so plurality of languages and a tradition. And so I think uh, it uh, is about another concept of history. And there is a sentence in Goethe's elective um, uh, essay on Goethe, which says, uh, that in contrast uh, to uh, um, Garga Zirke, so the concept of a poet as a hero, uh, that uh, from God the common the Forderung und nicht auf Gaben. So from, mm -hmm. from, from God we get um, demands and not tasks or assignments. <coughs> this is Goethe. Benjamin, Benjamin, Benjamin. Benjamin. Ah, so. that uh, is um, defending, I don't remember who, no? sorry, <laughs> against the uh, Goethe, um, Georg, Georg, Georg. 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 Against whom? Georg. Oh, yeah. Uh, this conception of a poet as a hero, I mean, I don't know, I, I, yeah. know, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> but. Well, that, that, oh. Uh, these are biggies, these are very important, and it's a, uh, um, Hölderlin says that we arrive at the truth at the moment, or the truth, or das Wahre, uh, emerges at the moment, closing in on us when we have to say goodbye. So this is, um, these are very important uh, interventions and questions, and one might want to consider what Benjamin has to say precisely about Hölderlin's poem, Dich der Mut, the courage of the poet and the poetic figure that is a kind of um, uh, not a transmitter so much as a receptive um, um, vulnerability that exposes itself and through which something like language um, traverses so that the poet stands in a kind of um, nakedness and exposure, extreme and radical exposure that can also zap him or her and destroy. Uh, the poet is the place where figuration can happen. It's in a nucleated place. It's not a person. I mean, I was going to ask Chris, because in a conversation with another friend, uh, Susan Bernstein, she said that we're wrong to even say human Dasein, that that's not Heidegger, that that's a, um, a distortion. I think he does use the phrase. But I thought he did too, but in any case, um, for Benjamin reading the enucleated space that the so-called poet occupies and creates as, as it's very hard to, to say what the poet does, but kind of almost like catches the Hölderlinian lightning flash and brings it like Prometheus into language, but can be absolutely devastated and destroyed in the catch that that um, is required of the poet. So I don't know if that, that helps at all. It probably scrambles the code that we were trying um, carefully to put together. But there are, this we could add to our lexicon of stances, which is to say 
how the poet serves or is served up or used up and devastated by language, and why at the point to which Chris um, took us, there was a sudden reversion, or what, what is the gesture on the part of Heidegger when Goethe shows up? And what does the signature, the prestige, the undisputed prestige of Goethe mean? When, when Chris looked at me at that moment, it's because my first work was on the Goethe effect and all those in the German languages, including Benjamin and others, and Freud, who were uh, freaked out by Goethe and yet dreamt about him, woke up sobbing. That's, that's Benjamin, he says, I had a dream where Goethe came to me and was sitting at the table and he touched my elbow and I woke up sobbing. For Freud, Goethe, who seals the deal on all sorts of theoretical moves and maneuvers that Freud suddenly bails on, He'll say, well, as Goethe proves or says, this is how the superego is, is constructed. So there, there's the law. We have nothing more to say. Or here, there's a moment where Heidegger, uh, that, that was just pointed out, is trying to explain to us something like the technological turn. Hmm. And suddenly it's, well, Goethe said it. He knew it already. And so my question was in this first book, what does this um, invitation to a killer text and signatory, which Goethe was, because he's associated by all these um, signatories, such as from, I don't know where, to, Nietzsche, for example, excuses Goethe from the um, general mobilization of those who are resentful, those who, have, who um, are not noble, those who can't handle the truth. Um, everyone, practically everyone, is included in that loser's list, except Goethe, of course. Nietzsche will always say, Goethe's the only one who understood and could do it. And Nietzsche might have been the strongest and had the most immunocompetence, poor little shy, sickly Nietzsche, to, could barely eat had to throw up not only to reverse dialectics, but um, <laughs> just was the, the philosopher, uh, the vomiting <laughs> philosopher. Um, Nietzsche was the strongest body who could handle Goethe, who could invite him and, and um, enjoy him. Everyone else that um, you could scan and monitor and read, and maybe Heidegger's powerful enough to um, to handle and cope with Goethe. Still, the question, just to abbreviate it, is when are the poets called in, as we started to ask? When does philosophy need poetry? Is there a sexual politics? Come here, girl, you know, service me, pleasure me. What, what is the relationship? Or is, um, is poetry the father of, of all Phyllis, the, the shunned, repressed, murdered father, the paternal um, uh, deceased that is called upon to um, back you up when your thought either goes into a ditch or you can't finish, you can't say, or you can't measure up to the poetic insight. So presumably now if we back down a little, calm down, get off the ledge and dial down my hysterical um, exaltation right now. Well, if I can say it, I'm not a hysteric, so don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> um, when do you call in the, the absolutely uh, unbreakable power of the poetic word? Is it a sign of, I mean, and how do you how do you even measure it? Is it a sign of power, powerlessness, helplessness? Are you calling in the troops? Are you, are you uh, running in an emergency supply of meaning? Is this an openness, a gaping gap, a wound where you don't know how to say it? 
Or is it philosophy demean not demeaning, but humbling itself and bowing to the power of the poetic saying? Poetry has seen something. Or is it a rewrite altogether? Come here, let me make you say, as he does with Hölderlin. Heidegger makes Hölderlin say stuff that Hölderlin never said, so to speak. And he makes him politically, he activates him politically in ways that um, we tried to show in different ways Hölderlin was would have been really puking about, right? So um, that that would be a, a beginning. Yeah, let me just add a couple things in relation to what you said. But, um, yeah, yes, your work on Goethe is fantastic. I, I was I just remembering something about the significance of Blanchot's gesture in that little text. You know, Goethe is the one he goes after in that text. Well, he knew how to distinguish. Well, Hegel, but. Uh, um, you know, Goethe also in the house, you know, in his papers. Hegel, Hegel knows how to distinguish between Goethe and Goethe. Well, Rochot um, also says that no one will forgive Goethe for surviving the shipwreck that everyone else fell to. Everyone around Goethe committed suicide, freaked out, went nuts, and Goethe somehow, like a cartoon figure, always got up from his devastations and the damage he caused. Because Werther was a killer text. Everyone copycatted suicide, uh, the stuff that, that Goethe would send out. And then Goethe would get up from the wreckage and survive in this powerful way that Blanchot says would never be forgiven. Um, just, you know, one of the, um, just a bit to sort of pull some threads together, um, when, um, there are two things about a third thing. The, the, I think one of the things that Heidegger is miming with this gesture of naming that we were talking about, Gestalt, which is a, a, a case of, a, he suggests it is a, it's a daring act. Um, and if I take from that notion of Fermutum that, that he, he, he develops in um, his, his essays on language, um, it is, it, it, in some sense, I, I suppose he would say, you know, what goes on in the, in, in the, uh, the question concerning technology, his answer is, I name technology the same way as I name language. I mean, it's, in that, it's in that act of naming that he's trying to engage with his mittens and, and with this peculiar task of, of trying to engage that mittens that's coming through language. And, um, uh, so trying to, trying to use a something that language has given in such a way as to reveal something that, that language is, is uh, indicating and hinting and so on and so forth. So there's a, it's, it's a very powerful um, play going on there in, in this naming. And that naming is, is when it happens in, in um, the the, um, the language essay. Um, he says uh, when he actually names the essence of language, he says, "May the essence of language be called Alphus," and he uses a subjunctive way um, that it should be called Alphus. The same subjunctive here occurs when he speaks when he evokes the notion of human being. That human being should endure, and, and it says I, I can't remember the exact phrase, but you'll find it. It's a very um, the, the actual, the command or the geheis is there. Um, that human being should endure. Um, and, and, and he uses the subjunctive. Well, that subjunctive is Hölderlin's subjunctive, uh, which comes out of Ich warte, ich sah es kommen und was ich sah, das Heilige sei mein Wort. May the Holy be my word. And this is outrageous, <laughs> you know, kind of step at that point. At the same time, humble, you know, may, may my word partake of this, um, this, this, this whole. And um, so you, you have, uh, I think that, that there's, a, there's a case of, um, uh, you know, Heidegger uh, so almost adapting a usage which is, um, which, which is, I think, highly respectful in that sense. And, and, uh, but also it's a very, very interesting case of, of naming and a sort of a leap in language that, that, that's occurring um, to, to, to engage in this other, you know, that, that, um, that Hölderlin is, is evoking at that point. This, this flash. You know, this, uh, um, so uh, I'll just finish on uh, one point of authority, and then, or do you want to jump in? I just wanted to say that on our first day together, we, we talked about what it meant to say, let us do something. Right. Because I jumped into the abyss of, of maybe we shouldn't be recalling this, of Wolfgang walking out on a speaker. And I said, let us agree to. And so what was 
what kind of a speech act has led us, because I didn't, it, it seems to be humble and suggestive, and yet I really posited and signed for everyone yeah. um, a, a peace treaty or something. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, authorities, I think that one of the really, um, really incredible tasks that the students in the EGS have, and by the way, I suddenly realized why I was referring to eggs and spoons. <laughs> anyway, um, the, uh, the, the middle that, that, that students, I think, and even, have, even the, the, um, the faculty have, is um, how do you deal with all these authorities? You know, uh, um, you've, got, you've, got, you've got an abundance of authorities here, right? uh, to, to such a degree that authority itself becomes very problematic, or should become problematic, and I think that's a good thing. But of course, you have this task of uh, engaging with the authority as an authority, because to learn, you have to lend yourself to this to this word and, and its way of, of, of presenting itself and all its uh, outrageous self <laughs> you know, self aggrandizement and imposition. Um, but at the same time, um, you have to learn a, a sort of, uh, like I say, a, a distance from that authority, and and uh, which is also the condition of relating to another authority as such. And, 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 and as that multiplies, I don't know how you do it. It's three times a day, most days, right? You've got, you've got three discourses a day. And that's absolutely insane. Um, but, uh, and it could drag, I think probably has driven some people to insanity. But there is a, um, there's, I think also maybe, maybe in that multiplication of authorities, you start to get something like a free use. Uh, and the way that we're, that he's evoking here. Um, authority, authority and false authority. Well, is that too? Yeah. Um, but the question of authority, I think, is well. Abhital is going to come back to this in her uh, graduation lecture on Monday, I think. So I'll, I'll just leave that as a, a you know, as, a, as, a, as an invitation and uh, an anticipation. I have to say, I, you know, I said to Abhital the other day about, about courage. I do want to say something about courage. It's it's a it's a constant um, question for me in, in terms of how one chooses one's path. I, I guess I'm talking to students and I'm talking about people who. Have and, a, and about authorities, how, how one chooses one's path, intellectual path. And my choice has been, I, I, I think it's, it's one, I, 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 I guess I don't know the word that's coming to mind is Hugh, or I, I, I stay very close to the text. You know, I've, 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 um, I've sailed very close to the, to, to the coast in a certain sense. And I've done that very intentionally because I'm interested in the rocks by the coast, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, the best winds, the most interesting winds, the currents, and, the surf, you know, it's near the coast. And so I like to stay near the text. I like to, to be near the language. And at the same time, you know, I realize I've been hesitant to break out into the open sea. And um, I think uh, Avital is someone who doesn't hesitate to go out onto the sea like Nietzsche says. And, and, uh, Thank you. Talk about cards. This girl is, uh, you know, just uh, incredible. And, and I, I just, no, excuse me, I'm not finished. <laughs> um, and I just said to her the other day, this is the person who brings the best out of Jacques Derrida. I mean, this and this is courage. This is you know to go that far, to go out you know out to see that much. Um, yeah. like we can develop in that other ways, but but uh, to go out to see that yeah, much is a very courageous it. thing. And and it's and these are these are you know these are gestures of thought, different forms of authority, you know, fundamentally different forms of authority. I think. And, and um, you know they're always with Abital. It's always faced with with a, you know a lot of <laughs> a lot of hard work in the text and so forth. But they are. Very different forms of authority, different gest language gestures, different forms of courage or failures in courage. I don't know. Um, it's it's an incredibly difficult question, and I think that uh, Avital is very good at bringing out the complexity of that question. And, and, and all of this is part of language use, you know, uh, and, and all of this is what you need to be studying. What we actually say, you know, in our authoritative way, we we the, the faculty of the EGS is really. Uh, I'm not sure how important it is. I think much more important is, is, is studying those gestures, studying those forms of authority, studying those uses of language, and then for yourself deciding what path you take, what, what, you know, how your voice will take form, and, and you know, what a voice will be for you. Know, so, um, I think this kind of experience is especially um, rich because you know, here we have two voices uh, interlacing, which have interlaced for a very long time, but we haven't done it publicly. And, and in any way, I think ever so. It's it's uh, you know I think it's for me it's a wonderful experience to to hear this difference between us and also these these points of, uh, you know where we touch in a long history of uh, of friendship. So um, I hope that that aspect of what we've done today will be um, visible to you and perhaps the most important thing in what we what we've done. Thank you so much, Mike. The figuration that I was thinking of as you were speaking was. Um, 
the way I shudder up sometimes when I feel an offshore hurricane <laughs> menacing, you know, that, that, that I thought, what's my relation to the coast and the seas, you know, it's that sense of an impending, but the offshore hurricane, well, we don't have time to, to think that as beautifully as you just did, culling the stones and so on. Let me say um, that there was a moment where I had to t choose a teacher, I'm responding to what you said, and it looked as though the choice might be between Deman, Paul Deman, and Derrida, and I, I went to Derrida for many, many reasons, but also because he was a nurturing and a good mother. He was, he was uh, affirming of one's work. I don't know if you experienced him that way. Whereas Demand was so tough that I thought he would break me down. And I was already um, too sensitive. And it, it, I mean, there's all sorts of considerations. You know, some people need uh, the truth brandishing um, authority of Badiou to hold them together. Other people are strong enough to um, to look at where things fissure and the master code is scrambled and, and broken off, where calls are dropped, where one is uh, trembling over an abyss. Depends also, and when I remember, I remember when I chose what to write on for my dissertation. Part of the promise was that we would talk a little bit of your writing, about your writing. This may be completely irrelevant to some of you, but I thought, look, this is a, a pretty long-term relationship, one or two years. Okay, for me, that's long-term. Um, <laughs> well, you can't flirt with others. You've got to live with, be with, you know, love what you're doing. So, you know, they're moving in. So um, I thought, you know, it has to be... Um, um, an upper for me. I, I don't. I I would be endangered in my first work of en endurance or my endurance test, which is to say the long term relationship of your first text, which um, is a dissertation, the institutionally watched over text. I I I had to look out for myself and make sure that I wasn't going to be um, um, terribly destroyed or devastated by my choices. We've discussed the difference in Heidegger between destruction and devastation. Destruction is good, it clears away, kicks, kicks away what is already dead and hanging around and, and just burdening your being in a certain way. Whereas devastation, as you know, uh, promises no futurity, doesn't clear or clean anything up, just leaves you. So I had to make choices according to all sorts of protocols of um, intimate um, um, helplessness, weakness. What would I needed power pills. I needed the kind of texts and authors that were going to um, to be my um, great cheerleaders. You know, not a firing squad in front of which I was <laughs> standing, and maybe they would shoot or not, and I'd be reprieved or not but they turn out to be the same very often. In any case, all of these things, you deserve to give yourself the time, the intensity, um, the struggle of understanding what it is in a Nietzschean way that will affirm you, hold you, bolster, boost you, if that's what you need. Nietzsche always asks, he says, he always asks, where a text comes from, what kind of fatigue, hatred, pessimism. Um, believe it or not, there are people who write, and maybe this is what fuels them, they write because they hate something. They, they just want to say what shit it is or something. Nietzsche wants to see where's the fresh and replenishing energy in work. He asks, and that's part of his um, kind of a probe, he wants to sense or feel if this came out of a powerful, loving, um, <coughs> holding pattern with an infinite alterity. He doesn't think that and doesn't ask that you fuse with your work or you identify or that it comes out of your pathetic losses or this or that. I'm quoting Nietzsche here, you know, or 
this happened to you and that happened to you. That This is Nietzsche. If that's a strengthening, then yes, Nietzsche will say yes. But if, if, um, if writing or engaging with your object, many, many quotation marks, is like uh, the, the, um, the expression of, of your depletion, exhaustion, and misery that you want to spread, Nietzsche said, give us a break. Don't do it. We don't want it. Do you want it? This is your decision all the time, you know. But don't hesitate. You deserve to also take these possible, <laughs> very philosophical and yet very intimate um, uh, points of relatedness into consideration as you decide who's going to move in with you and persecute you and haunt and hound and, and also delight you. Because there, there, there are times in writing and, and your artistic and poetic production and poesis where you're in the zone, where you're exalted in a trance. It's, it's all suddenly worth it. So try to be careful with, you can't pre-program or predict what's going to happen in this relationship, but try to give yourself the care and, and anxiety of choosing what you're going to work with, whom you're going to allow in for your first sustained text, and also, um, there was something else, but then I looked at you because I thought we had, oh, I would suggest that you start small, like the Greeks. <laughs> uh, start small and let it grow, and don't start with overwhelming, you're going to figure out the history of you know, thought or something, because then you'll be submerged <laughs> and miserable, and start small with the little flower that appears in Heidegger, or, or that's not small, uh, just as small as possible, and then let it grow as it will, because I think that strategically and tactically is the only way to go with something. Let it grow as it will, let it become an on, an ex. But a lot of people, especially at your uh, fabulous age of self-assertion, start with way too big of a project and then are abandoned by it or, or abused by it and have to um, and, and experience it as a terrible nightmare. But I think this can really um, be um, an experience of joy and affirmation in a non-Californian sense. <laughs> with all the suffering, yeah, with all the malheur and affliction that, that is involved. So we, we, some of us have talked about um, Heidegger's bringing together thinking and thanking, Denken and Duncan, and I'd like to think and thank you. We'd like to think and thank you. I'd like to think and thank you. And um, Mark and, and <coughs> sing praises to your braveness and courage, uh, the way you take risks, the way you have become this, this exposed um, receptivity that, that does and doesn't know what's coming in and going out. But if you can stay in this impossible knot of, of, of difficulty that you're in now, I think that, that would be already amazing. Don't judge it. Let, let people teach according to their rhythms. Appreciate the slowness. Appreciate, if possible, the warp speed that some of us have um, imposed on you. Appreciate the impossibility of all of our tasks, you know, and that we are here. Who the hell knows why we're here and what we're doing? I always tell people here who ask me, well, why are we doing this? Well, that's an abyss opener. Don't even ask. You know, it's like what in the cartoons or whatever when a somnambulist wakes up and notices she or he is on a tight rope between skyscrapers. <laughs> Let's not wake up yet. <laughs> okay, so you've been great. You're fabulous. We're going to work some more, and we're always sending out and being sent by you to, to continue our work together. And thank you so much.